of his pituitary. 26. Un
Just as a reminder, this channel is for educational or perhaps entertainment purposes only. It's always important to do your own research and come up with your own conclusions. Hello everybody, happy Saturday to y'all. Hope your weekend's treating you well out there. So, um, we are on part nine tonight of Memories of the Afterlife, Michael Newton's Life Between Lives book, where we talk about life between lives, past life regressions, reincarnation, spirit guides, soul groups, life scripts, and more. And I'm looking forward to spending part of the evening with you. And we are in the final phases of the book. Uh, just by kind of looking at it, it seems like we are probably probably be like this video and one more maybe two tops but so this video one more and so either two or three including today so but likely just be two we'll probably knock it out after the next one or the next stream okay so let's get right into it Oh, let me just uh, say, let's see. No, I got that. Okay, good. All right, here we go, my friends. So. 26. Unblocking a Spiritual Goal. By Dorothea Foucault, Germany. Medical Team, Stiftung Auswig. Director, Akademie für Heilung. Wilhelm Reich Institute. Holistic Psychotherapist. Benjamin is the subject of this remarkable story. He is a tall, thin, pale, and seemingly physically weak man. Shy, withdrawn, and lacking drive, nonetheless he is gentle, kind, and very intelligent. Benjamin's LBL session enabled his profound, transforming release from life-restraining physical blockages in the head. There is a chronic and painful blockage of energy in his sinuses and in the brow region of his third eye, the junction of his optic nerve and the area of his pituitary. What was hidden behind these blocks, and where would removing them lead? Benjamin's emotional problems led to a generally reserved demeanor. He was even emotionally and sexually restrained toward his wife. At the core of his suffering was the unfulfilled search for his life purpose. For a period of four years, I worked with him intermittently, and then for two more years, I saw him for regular psychotherapy, using various skills including talk therapy, hypnotherapy, and regressions into several past lives. There was a focus on his severe childhood traumas, and over time, these sessions provided deep healing. But it was an astounding discovery during his Life Between Lives session that finally dissolved his blocks and set him onto a fulfilling new life path. Benjamin is now 30 years old. When I first met him, I noticed the extraordinary expression in his eyes. In my 30 years in this profession, I had never before seen a client with such dark, deep, soulful eyes. I was reminded of artists' portraits of the eyes of Jesus Christ. I never told him this, but later in this chapter you will hear about his own Christ experience. Benjamin studied film at his university. Frustrated by academic life and disoriented in general, he came for psychotherapy. Having made some progress, Benjamin was inspired to become a healing practitioner. He went to college to learn osteopathy and naturopathy. However, even there he couldn't find his professional niche. Despite achieving his certification, he didn't begin working in a healing profession, but instead worked as a driver, delivering health foods. I found it hard to understand and accept this, especially as by now he was married and had two small children. 
He was responsible for his growing family, but he was blocked, stuck. Eight years after completing regular therapy, Benjamin made an appointment to experience LBL. Benjamin brought many important questions to the LBL session. Which part of me restrains me from my own destiny? What blocks me from focusing my energies upon my goals? What is the root cause of my fear to use all my skills and energy for myself and others? What can I do to reach this core understanding and to overcome my blocks? How can I communicate with the earth in order to understand what's going on here? Is there a specific task for my family in our rapidly changing world? Why can I not fully feel and express love toward my wife and others? Benjamin went into deep trance easily and quickly. Despite his early severe traumas, he could remember pleasant childhood experiences. In the womb, he felt his body as physically weak but enduring. His soul slipped into his body during the second month of pregnancy because, in his own words, my body needed me for survival. He had chosen his body as a good channeling instrument for connection with the spiritual world. There was a fascination with sensuous perception and the beauty of the earth. The moment of incarnation, when his soul entered his tiny body, was very painful for his extremely sensitive brain and nervous system, especially at the nape of the neck, the base of the skull and brain. When his mother was stressed during the pregnancy, he helped her by sending out light, expanding his strong soul. He received insight that he had come into this incarnation with 85% of his soul energy, and there are times when he feels he is not utilizing all of it properly. Editor's Note Typically, souls join the fetus between the fourth and ninth month, because apparently in the first trimester, there is not enough brain tissue for soul integration with the human brain. I guided him into a past life where he recognized himself as a young man called Agathos, living within a temple community in early Mediterranean culture. He could designate neither time nor region, but he knew that many people made a pilgrimage to this temple seeking cures and knowledge. His work focused on techniques for creating expanded awareness in others. His task was to enhance therapeutic effects simply by concentrating his thoughts. He re-experienced and was touched by the happiness of community life and his love for his wife and children. He was amazed at all the events within the temple, and he was joyful as he participated in the precious knowledge that allowed him to do so much good for so many people. In his own simple words, it's a blessing. Suddenly, a blessing. he saw a scene of horror. Roman soldiers attacking the temple, killing people. Virtually the whole community was murdered, including his family. Lovely. Though frightened and shocked, he escaped. He carried a papyrus scroll with him, something precious that he was able to save. Now, I'm just going to say, um, this is another case where, you know, you can kind of, where it goes, it's eh, kind of on the fence, um, possibly BS, but interesting moments, if true. Not remember its exact contents, only that it dealt with sacred knowledge for humankind. During his escape, he feared the scroll could get into the hands of the wrong people, so, reluctantly, he hid it in a mountain cave. Then he moved on to the north, eventually settling in a small village where he tried to preserve and pass on to selected people the knowledge he'd learned from his temple life. However, he felt lonely, sorrowful, and fearful. Later, he was captured by his enemies and then tortured, finally dying in prison. He could not remember the exact events, just that he did not reveal the secret of the scroll. Okay, so here are key words, right? He cannot remember the exact events. Can't remember the events. You know, involved here with life between lives, past life regression, and even then, he's only getting so much information, which is something I talk about a lot. I think it's really important to remember that, that... Even if you go and, and have these, it's not like you're going to burst open every little detail imaginable. You will you can get a lot. You can get a decent little chunk here and there, but you're not going to get the whole picture. And you're not going to get the picture in exquisite detail about every single life that you've had here. I mean, it's just, it's, that's why it's like even those who go this far have regressions or maybe mediums or individuals who can connect on a 
uh, more intuitive level or connected level with the matrix than the bulk of society, they are still only getting so much. So no one's special. No one has, you know, uh, the grand knowledge of everything and this and that. Like, um, really important to remember that. We're all in this together. We're all going through this experience together. And, and obviously individually, but we're all here. We're all under the memory wipe. We're all inside, you know, these meat suits with limited processing power and trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And even those who have the deep connections, even they only can get so much. So nobody has all the answers. It's just not set up that way, which all by design. Deep within, and he observed the agonizing experiences from a secure distance, as if in a movie. Then his soul left his body, and we join him as he begins his LBL journey. He sees innumerable hovering light beings around him, each of different shapes, sizes, and qualities. He perceives them as angelic beings. There is a memory that in former times he was one of them, and he feels their ancient and intensive bond. They take care of the balance of power in the universe and even intervene if someone on Earth calls on them for help. The being next to him is light blue violet, pulsating in form. His unpronounceable name means welcome with bubbly joy. Okay, hold on. Another being Let's back it take up a minute. feels their ancient and intensive bond. Ancient they... and intensive bond. So, been around for a while. Been around the block. In the universe and even intervene if someone on Earth calls on them for help. And they'll even intervene with someone on Earth if they make the call. You know how many individuals out there suffer every day, go through absolute horrors, begging for God, begging for Jesus or whoever, and nothing happens? And then there's obviously um, kind of like this connection that most of us can have when you are really at your breaking point. When you, I'm talking pinnacle, pinnacle moments in life, not everyday struggles or even really horrible days or not even necessarily trauma. I mean, it usually is based around trauma, uh, heavy trauma, and that could be emotional or physical. That's when the matrix can tend to step in if it thinks that it could lose you. That's my opinion on what's happening because that, that's really what the information tends to show is that you have to really, really be at the end of your ropes and what happens then? Well, the matrix steps in and it gives you this ease, this sense of relief that there is someone out there looking, looking out for you, that God is there or Jesus or whoever. They're there waiting to help you. And they heard they're, they're answering your call. But the majority, the vast, vast majority it's not like this is going to be happening every day. What about the child who's being abused every day? Hmm? What about the child who's being trafficked or the adult who's being trafficked? And they have to go through utter hell day in and day out. You think 1-800-JESUS is going to be answering every time? Hell no, they're not. So, you know, it's very selective process on how this all happens. Blue-violet, pulsating in form. His unpronounceable name means welcome with bubbly joy. Another being oh, yeah, appears as bubbly. a masculine-looking giant of pure reddish energy. He especially senses the upper body and that this is an aspect of the Archangel Uriel, who criticizes Benjamin kindly but sternly. Really? Editor's Note Many people believe in the religious mythology of angels. Thus, conscious interference from a prior belief system is always a consideration when a client in trance exclaims they see angels, usually at the gateway into the spirit world, after death. Jung believed that comforting myths were expressions of the basic needs of humankind. I feel that from our earliest beginnings, human beings have had a yearning for spiritual guardians to provide self-protection, 
in a difficult and often. Okay, so from the beginning, now he may be right that, you know, we look for exterior sources to help us. You know, oh God, oh Jesus, oh angels, oh Mary, whatever. Oh baby Jesus, you know, all this stuff. So it's... So if it goes back that far... It, where is a lot of that coming from once we're here? It's coming from the Matrix. The Matrix is providing you the propaganda to have and hold those belief systems. Now, does that mean that someone out in like the middle of the uh, jungle or something uh, and is not going to connect, try and you know ask for help or connect with something on exterior to himself? It's it's going to be the kind of the same basic concept because of how the human experience is cult and often cruel world my belief is that from our earliest beginnings human beings have had a yearning for spiritual guardians to provide self protection in a difficult and often cruel world my Where belief is that? is that the concept of angels as religious symbols evolved into a mental archetype for what is actually personal spirit guides. Okay, so so the, it's a mental archetype that are actually representing themselves to be spirit guides, which are Matrix marketing department employees. That's, the, that's like the end translation right there. It's not, you know, it, even though, yes, we... If you have a belief system that you hold dear... Or even just kind of cling on to. But it's a belief system that is connected with this whole matrix system. Then the matrix will customize that experience to you. And so what do you see in some religions? You see angels. Right? So these type of things will manifest themselves. And Newton's saying like, oh, they're spirit guides. No. they're Yeah, they may be cloaked underneath as like a quote-unquote guide or a teacher but it's a guide or teacher involved with the matrix marketing department to get you and i to believe in it and continue falling for the same thing over and over and over again until crossing into the afterlife spirit guides are sometimes visually misinterpreted at first as angels with wings because they float and have radiant light around an ethereal head and shoulders as they come toward the newly discarnate soul. Despite all of Uriel's efforts over many incarnations to send him energy, Benjamin is still refusing to accept and use that energy. It is high time for this to change, for it is a gift. A long time ago, this wonderful being had placed a switch behind Benjamin's third eye, which had become jammed in the off position. Superficially, this jamming had been triggered by an experience in his present life, during which Benjamin had fixed an aggressive boy with a hateful look powered by his third eye after receiving harassment from the youngster. Frightened silly, the little bully ran away, having certainly glimpsed in Benjamin's eyes the power of his spiritual energy. Scared of his own power, however, Benjamin had decided he would no longer use it in this life. Okay, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause it and back it up because Jane brings up a good question. I have talked about it before, but it's... It's relevant to this case and a lot of what we talk about. So Jane says, uh, why do they even get any amount of healing anyways? Wouldn't that risk the person finding out the reality of this place? And then she says, I just, this was to prepper. I just wonder why some people are allowed Gaining abilities, if that might make them more aware of this place. Or maybe I'm not thinking of it in the right context. I, my opinion, Jane, is that the Matrix needs individuals out there to uh, relay, you know, hope and faith and belief inside of the system. And it also, a lot of times when you're dealing with mediums or... Uh, whatever, right? You're, you're. A lot of people go because they want to contact like a deceased loved one. Uh, some people want, you know, obviously for for greed, financial gain, or something, or to kind of see how their future may plan out. And sometimes they can get some amazing information. But what are, what are the, what are they tapping into in the grand scheme of things? They're tapping into the matrix. 
So all they're doing is taking money from within the system, and all that does is further compound the belief of the system when those things happen. Like, say someone, you know, the psychic or the medium says, okay, you're going to walk into, you know, uh, $20,000 within the next year. Or, um, you know, or your father's talking to me, your mother's talking to me, and they and the medium conveys a certain amount of information where the individual knows that there's no way that the medium could have known that, and it's it's definitely mom, it's definitely dad, and so it's just like further keeping them in the system. I don't see. I don't think it's like a liability at all. I think it's just something that is there, and even the mediums are not necessarily going to be getting the whole picture either. Obviously. Otherwise, we, I think we would hear a lot more. Uh, but they're just connecting within the system that they're allowed to connect in. And that's likely been agreed to as part of their life script before they even got here. That, okay, we're going to be, you know, you're going to be a little more open this go around. And, you know, you can maybe help people or, or this or that. So it could kind of also like feed their ego pre-birth whatever the case may be, or it may be something that they enjoy as part of their life script. And the matrix knows it's not going to matter in the end because they're just going to keep coming back anyways. Uh, nobody ever gets a full picture. I mean, you, you can talk to tons of people who have done, had breakthrough trips and, and, and out of body experiences, and, you know, uh, astral projection, all this stuff, lucid dreaming. And at the end of the day, it, all it continues to do is further confirm this system within the system. So it's not a liability at all. It really isn't. Now, some, you know, a very, very small percentage may see through it, but the overall benefit that the matrix receives by allowing these things, which further perpetuate the belief in the system, far outweighs the amount that will actually come to see it as a soul trap. So... I hope that kind of uh, helps a little bit. But a uh, great question. In this life, how often have we heard the phrase, be careful what you wish for, for you will surely get it? Editor's note. Some subjects in the unconscious state do carry conscious memories, ideas, and concepts into the early stages of their spiritual regression. The third eye chakra is symbolically considered by believers to be the gate that leads to the inner spiritual realms through a higher consciousness. But was this the whole story? The revelations continue as we rejoin Benjamin in his LBL experience. He perceives his own soul as light, forming a drop shape and containing the colors violet, blue, silver, and gold. He feels truly exhausted, old, and scarred by his human incarnations. As he becomes aware of this, he immediately receives revitalization within a bath of liquid white light, a treatment from a team whose members resemble bearded Greek philosophers. This team then urges him to look closely at a particular experience in depth. During an incarnation ages ago as a wise woman, she and other like-minded people experimented with the best of intentions, to preserve our planet from being vandalized by destructive people. Oh boy, that This group out tried well. to focus their mental power in unison, but apparently the experiment backfired. The telekinetic energy imploded and settled behind their third eyes and at the bases of their brains, resulting in mental breakdowns. Benjamin's deep fear of becoming mentally non-functional jammed his own switch in the off position. This specific fear had already appeared countless times during psychotherapy, and at last, amazing as it sounds... The cause was now uncovered. Benjamin then receives instructions from his treatment team for the removal of his blockage. They advise him to train his third eye, to consciously cultivate contact with his spirit guide, maintaining his spiritual power at a productive level and enabling him to receive regular instructions. It is time to open his heart and, above all, to forgive himself, to give and to accept love. At this moment, he catches sight of a brightly lit form with loving eyes, an image he perceives as Jesus Christ, or perhaps oh, a projection boy. of his own Christ aspect. His instructions continue. 
He must regularly put a rock crystal onto his third eye and drink crystal-infused water. Oh, come on. Moreover, it is beneficial for him to link with nature using the sensory perception of the moment. Okay, so let's just pause it up, all right? Um, if I remember correctly, in the beginning, um, the practitioner was linked to the Wilhelm Reich Foundation, which, uh, you know, I think anyone who kind of seeks... Uh, spiritual topics will have likely come across that type of some of that information, not all of it, but you know, you, you'll generally know the name. All right. But it's, it's oftentimes lumped in with the new age and stuff like that. So the person who had the regression, uh, it must've had some sort of connection with the new age and stuff like that, you know, or the practitioner, has a, a new agey side and, and they may have led them towards a certain thing like, oh, you need a crystal water and, you know, the pyramid and your third eye, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. So when you hear stuff like this, I know it's cringy, but take into account the, the, the source of where the practitioner is coming from, the organization that was openly named and, and all that stuff. I know, I know it's cringy. I get it. And, you know, I'm not, you know, everyone has their, their methods and ways that they do what they do spiritually. And, you know, I'm not knocking that because if it helps someone, great. Um, but if it keeps them continually stuck in the matrix, then that's not good. But it's still on them to find their way out on their own terms by continuing to seek and not just settling down with, for instance, you know, someone like, Wilhelm Reich Foundation or, you know, uh, anyone out there, right? Or David Wilcock, you know, or <laughs> all these all these individuals out there. Or Rudolf Steiner and on and on and on. You can put all the names out there. And, uh, you know, the, the point is is to always continue seeking and looking and looking and looking. I mean, that's that's what I did. That's how I kind of came to to find and, and really look at this world this clown show this realm in a, in a different way and you know i've talked about it quite a few times how you know i would read the the nde books or, or a lot of these experiencer type books and i would be eating you know i would be eating it up you know fork and knife like oh my god you know it's about love you know it's oh my god this is great so there is a reason there is an explanation for all this insanity you know i was eating it up and then you, then you have to roll things back, come to your senses and say, whoa, 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 back up the truck. But this still occurs. But this still occurs. And it goes, it flies in the face of common sense. It's just a big smack upside the head. So, yeah, David Wilcox. Oh, my God, please. Uh, it's freaking, all right. I, I'm, you know, <laughs> unbelievable, that guy. All right, I'm not, I, you know, I try not to trash anyone if I can help it, but Jesus Christ. In a specific tone, and he receives a recipe for an herbal ointment to put on his neck, lips, third eye, and heart chakra. Editor's Note. Conscious feedback in this case indicates enlightenment from a divine spirit that is more metaphysically spiritual than religious. The healing team tells him... Okay, that it's, it's more metaphysical and not religious. Well, the metaphysical, you know, I guess you can say movement or mindset, rolls right into the New Age. Does that mean that there aren't benefits within it? Of course not. There are absolutely benefits with certain types of practices if they work for you. Because really, all it comes down to is the intention that you're putting into a certain spiritual practice. It doesn't have to be crystals. It doesn't have to be this or that. The reason why things like crystals and uh, all these different types of things work is because they're in, they're be, the energy behind them is infused with the item. They're putting their intention into it. They believe in it. And what they're also doing online when they're seeking information is they're getting further confirmation bias. 
which again, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. If it's, if it's helping you, it's when you allow it to control or I'm not necessarily control, but stop you in seeking further. That's when it becomes a problem. I mean, that's really what everything boils down to, right? Like even just seeking ABC truths about like, let's just say politics, you know, or, or some crap like that, you know, it's like, there has to be a progressive movement in your seeking and you can't let it eat you up and consume your every move where all you're doing, you know, for the next, the rest of your life is buying fucking crystal books. You know what I mean? Let's just call it what it is. You know, you, at some point you've got to broaden your horizons more and say, well, there's got to be more. But if you allow yourself to just be thwarted, well, guess what? The Matrix has you in that box, ready and waiting, and it's won you over. It's, it's accomplished its job to distract you and make sure that you are not going to move forward. And most likely, if you get stuck with crystals for 30, 40 years or the rest of your life, well, you're fucked. That's really the bottom line. You know, I mean, like, that, but that's, but look, that's, with the caveat that you haven't continued seeking during that whole time, right? It's like that you've settled that, you know, like, oh, it's just crystal energy and, you know, everything's fine. And, you know, uh, Archangel Michael is with me and we're all good. And, you know, my nut chakra is glowing and everything's going to be fine. You know, no. I mean, it's like, come on. Like, there has to be progression. There has to be. Physically spiritual than religious. The healing team tells him that his task in life is to use his eyes to detect the causes of his patient's diseases, to remove negative pathological energy with his left hand, and to transfer healing energy into the sick body with his right hand. From now on, he will receive healing recipes from his spiritual guide. He must leave behind his fear of Earth's destruction and should develop more self-confidence and trust in the spiritual world. From this focus and trust, helpful forces may assist humankind, most importantly, he will be able to put all this into action right after the session. Then came the promise of a visit to South American shamans, a network of like-minded people who, as a result of his connection with them, will spread their healing work. The mission of his soul is to enrich the universe with his thirst for knowledge, inquisitiveness, learning, and integration. He and his family are lights in the dark, and his soul name, Azarel, or Azarel, links with the light blue silvery water element. He is then given a glimpse of his very first incarnation and experiences rocks in a different solar system outside oh, our galaxy. Wow. He incarnated there to experience the consciousness of dense matter, and he gained great pleasure from the awareness that he was united with the whole. His first earthly incarnation as a human being was in the early Stone Age, and he experienced a divine spark in the center of his body. Thus, this amazing and cosmic LBL session drew to its close. Benjamin told me, some days after the session, I participated in a parent-teacher meeting. During this meeting, I could see quite distinctly an angelic figure standing in the corner. The phenomenon was so clear and unequivocal that I almost had the impression that I could touch him as if he were a material entity. After Now, when you hear people talk about, like, after-death communication or sometimes, well, I guess you can't say ghosts, but they're, they are ghosts. Like, uh, I've spoken with individuals who lost those who are close to them and some will say like it, it the the individual you know the ghost or whatever the whatever the case may be looked like as physical as it can get it, it's not like it's like oh you can look through it or something like you have well you have those too but sometimes uh, the human perception cannot tell the difference and it looks like a full-fledged uh, carbon copy as if the individual is there in the physical. As if he were a material entity. After a while, this being revealed the reason for his appearance in this group. He told me he wanted to ensure the evening's success in order to strengthen the harmony and community of the school. In addition, he wanted the attendees to be consciously aware of the love of children. This event reinforced within me an acceptance of the omnipresence of spirits. I now know we are never really alone or isolated in life. 
I feel waves of joy about the possibility of interdimensional communication opening up for me. Now I know where my life task is leading me. If I can overcome my fear of the very strong Uriel energy of my soul guide and let it flow freely through my physical body, this energy will act directly on my own body and on the bodies of those I am treating. With the energies from my hands, I will start to shift my clients' blocked feelings. Above all, I will receive information that will measure and support the treatments, resulting in an immediate improvement of symptoms and conditions. It seemed that Benjamin was ultimately led to his mission as seer and healer by the blockage in his third eye. The eye has gradually opened, and he now experiences enhanced psychic perception and healing abilities. At times, he has experienced rational doubts about all this, but eventually he has come to accept his seeing talents as a healing gift. The painful built-up energy in his head has softened and gradually dissolved. Since his LBL session, upon awakening each morning, Benjamin receives healing energy and naturopathic prescriptions from Uriel and other spiritual guides. Good old Muriel. They obviously act for him, his family members, and for clients he is treating. He wrote to tell They obviously me, act for him. Or for them. You say for him or for their them? Their spiritual guides. They obviously act for him, his family for members, him. and for clients he is treating. He wrote to tell me that it is not easy for him to get used to the powerful Uriel energy, that he had to learn to let it flow through him. Benjamin is well on his way in his business and practice as an osteopath. From his past history, I know that Benjamin had little to do with angels or with the spiritual world, and that he was never religious. When I met him again, months after our session, he had a more lively and open personality, and, in great contrast to his earlier demeanor, he could laugh heartily. He now experiences a close connection with nature. This story shows, on many different levels, both the causes and the results of a single unresolved spiritual trauma, namely, in this case, the unfathomable backlash of focused personal power. Deep healing was accomplished throughout the physical body, the emotional and mental fields, and on the energetic, karmic, and spiritual planes. Benjamin became aware of the emotional backdrop of his present life, the power of playing around with destructive thought forces and the resultant feelings of guilt. He remembered past life imprints of violence, which led to an unconscious, physically repressed fear of using his power in his current life task to aid, heal, learn, and enlighten. Okay, so as you can see, like we've talked about throughout uh, a, a number of the videos in this series and in many other videos on the channel, is that, you know, the traumas endured in past lives carry over into your most recent this life your most recent incarnation and they can negatively affect you in all sorts of ways traumas fears phobias whatever the case may be assuming there isn't a well it's not even assuming uh, cuz you can you can have a trauma fear phobia that is generated here but who's to say that it wasn't perpetuated through something like the life script and as a result of possibly uh previous lifetimes right we don't know but for you know sake of argument let's just say that those who come here with unidentified or or not unidentified but um unknown reasons for having such fears, phobias, things like that, that are unexplainable. Like there's no reason in this lifetime for you to have them like being afraid, having a, like a deep fear of, of water, right? Or heights or whatever the case may be. I mean, I think many of us probably have issues with heights. Um, and it's just, it, it's ridiculous that things like that can carry over lifetime to lifetime and affect you in this lifetime when they have absolutely nothing to do with the life you're in right now. What the hell is that? Amazing, isn't it? And they're nestled away in the freaking subconscious. It's like the Matrix programs them on purpose. Well, they, it's not like they do. They they do it on purpose. That's exactly what they do. They program it on purpose to have you coming in here pre-baked with certain things that are going to bother you, which in turn will produce louche. 
Herman accessed the probable karmic background of his blockage, his headstrong and immature experimentation with creative power, albeit with good intentions, that was followed by a disastrous implosion and mental breakdown. On the physical plane, in his brain and nervous system, this theme appeared as an intolerance or reluctance to accept his own strong soul energy, quite high at 85%. Energetically, the blockage had manifested in the area of his third eye as a deep emotional fear, a fear of being overwhelmed by his own psychic power, which could be used to ruin himself. It's no surprise that originally his third eye vision spurred him into studying film, but now he has other visions. I imagine him working with his patients as they look into those deep, dark, soulful eyes. We still know very little about how unresolved ancient issues are transferred into other incarnations. In any case, Benjamin revealed in a single LBL session complete insight and spiritual help to solve his central blockage. The factors contributing to his remarkable healing were openness, knowledge, understanding, integration, self-forgiveness, love and blessing of and from the spiritual world. All these factors came together and formed a healing crescendo in this single session. I was given the pleasure and inner satisfaction of helping this young man to find his life task, to accept his gifts and attune to the power of his soul energy, and to use it for the benefit of others. One might argue that the changes I have described would have occurred anyway, as an after-effect of long-standing psychotherapy, or even spontaneously. However, there is an unequivocal chronological and contextual connection between the LBL session and Benjamin's ensuing changes two years after the end of the regular psychotherapeutic sessions and right after the single session. One could even conclude that the LBL session acted as an ignition spark for Benjamin's accumulated insights and breakthroughs. After all, transformation and healing are rarely the linear results of one single cause. They depend on complex interactions as well as grace and certainly not every LBL session would lead to such major changes and development. Benjamin's breakthrough experience was definitely an eye-opener on many levels, but primarily, together we had removed the blocks to his spiritual goal. Wow. That is going to resolve that case. So just popping this up here for timestamp purposes. Whenever I get to those... All right, so I just want to say hello to everyone on Rumble and Odyssey as well. Hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, by the way, I have a... Uh, I'll talk about it when I come back from the break or right before. So let's move on to the next case. 27. A Journey Toward Freedom. By Claire Albinson. Yeah, freedom in Fraudson, the Matrix. Cheshire, England. Lawyer, artist, author, and Reiki master specializing in therapeutic regression. Jody's life was at a very low ebb. His beginning had been less than auspicious. He was mildly autistic and suffered from a condition called nystagmus, which caused uncontrolled movement in his eyes. Later, he was found to be dyslexic. Then a hernia operation left him in grievous pain and greatly depleted his previously high energy levels. The pain and lack of energy caused detrimental changes in his life, and this led to severe depression. He attempted suicide. Despite his autism and dyslexia, Jody was highly intelligent in many spheres of life, most particularly in music and art, but because of his problems he was perceived by others to be thick or stupid. He even felt that his own mother was embarrassed and ashamed of him, and his conditions and his grandfather's cruel attitude toward him had added to the upset and humiliation that she had already felt. Lelouch. He was confused, unhappy, and often frustrated with life. The contrast between what was going on in his brain and what he was able to express was a source of constant frustration to him. Jody's two LBL regression sessions allowed him to find the acceptance that he needed for his body's limitations. It allowed him the freedom to be happy. Jody's life so far had been challenging. The hardest part had been the resentment that he felt for his own body and the many ways in which it had let him down. He could find no acceptance of the limitations that his body and its many disabilities had placed on him. This lack of acceptance had probably been compounded or perhaps even created by the shame that his mother had felt about his condition. Not surprisingly, his self-esteem was very low, and he wanted to change this. He needed to understand himself and wanted to know what his life purpose was within this seemingly useless body. He wanted release from his dreadful depression. He wanted to be happy. 
During regression in hypnosis, Jody relaxed easily and soon began to visualize pictures of a pretty 19-year-old girl who, he said, was full of confidence and tardy, sexually provocative. She was making a mess of her life through prostitution and low-life connections and had become pregnant with nowhere to go and no one to turn to. Finally, he watched her commit suicide by walking into the sea. He heard himself saying to her, Don't do it, don't do it. But she did. Though he was watching the action, it seems very likely that he was, in fact, watching himself in a past life. And it is interesting to note that in this life, Jody had himself felt desperate enough to attempt suicide, just as this girl had. Very often, when someone gets it wrong in one life, such as committing suicide, the soul seeks another similar situation in a further life to test itself again. So Jody was being tested again. And okay, so somewhere where you can see this play itself out, I believe was in, the, I know I've talked about this a bunch of times, like the, the life um, afterlife, or yeah, life afterlife, uh, four-part series, I think from the BBC. I'm pretty sure that's what happened to her. And, and of course, she had to keep working on it, working on it, working on it. But she was also uh, dealing with loads and loads and loads of abuse. Um, <laughs> lifetime after lifetime, I was sick. To test itself again. So Jody keep, was being keep, tested again. Keep being tested in miserable conditions. It, look, if someone is... <sighs> I mean, this is this is the type of thing that makes my blood boil. All right, let's just say this, right? If so, why does someone need to be tested over and over and over again? If they are at the point of uninstalling, why does the Matrix feel the need to keep pursuing this uh, this amazing life script over and over and over again? Why? Makes no sense except for what? Louche, louche, and. Like it gets its rocks off. It it it's like, it, it just it loves it loves every moment of it. So it's like, oh well, you know, oh well, you know, you, you've got to push through. You've got to, you've got to go back and be miserable again. And hopefully you push on through. And if it takes you a thousand lifetimes to do it, we're gonna get it done. And then guess what? You're going to reincarnate it again, and we're going to have a whole new set of bullshit for you to fall for. Getting it wrong again. But the attempt had been unsuccessful. He had given himself another chance. Having gone through the death process to the life beyond, he went on to be with his own guide, Galcian. Because of his Good very low Galcia. energy levels, his guide was asked, through Jody, if he had incarnated with enough energy for the tasks he was to accomplish in this life. The answer was no, he hadn't. So it was agreed that he could briefly receive more. For the next five or so minutes, Jody was the receiver of an incredible flow of energy. During this, he said that it felt as if he were plugged into a sizable electricity supply, leaving him greatly energized. It was easy to see from looking at and listening to him that the change had been substantial. Such energy boosts can only be temporary, but it must have remained with him long enough for his needs because Jody reported that he had four days of feeling fantastic. Editor's note. Soul energy is homogenous, so the portion that is left behind in the spirit world during an incarnation is no different in composition from what we bring to Earth. The differences are in energy volume. What is important to know here is that we cannot receive more on a permanent basis during a life. Jody's boost was temporary. The decision to bring a certain amount of energy is made in the spirit world based on a number of decisions by the soul, primarily the type of body that has been selected as the host in the next life. The reason an energy boost can only be temporary is that when we join the human brain in the fetal state, it is a delicate operation of melding, and in the process the brain has adapted itself to a given amount of energy. To increase it very high temporarily, or increase it at all permanently, would, as one client told me, blow the circuits. It would disrupt and even damage brain tissue. However, we may receive a brief temporary boost, either by ourselves or with the help of a guide during periods of trauma, such as a car accident, being in a coma, during sleep, or in an emotional crisis. 
Some people are capable of tapping into their own stored immortal energy in the spirit world. But personal guides often do this for us of their own volition, while we are praying for temporary sustenance during physical exercises such as yoga or in deep meditation. Shortly after our first session, it's a bombshell hit right when he was there. arrested on suspicion of rape. He was held in the cells, questioned, and charged by police. After his release, he was forced to leave his house and live away from his home area. His world was turned upside down. The woman who was his accuser not only denied her consent to the sexual act, she also denied their previous relationship. It was a harrowing time for Jody, but he told me that thanks to the regression and temporary energy boost, he had the courage to cope with it, emerging stronger than he would have ever expected. The work he had done helped him to understand his accuser was a sick lady for whom he was able to feel pity. She would have to live with her conscience while his was clear. Jody would have to wait for many months for the opportunity to prove his innocence, and that waiting was an ordeal for him. It was during this time of high uncertainty that Jody experienced a formal life-between-lives regression as a follow-up from the therapeutic session that had preceded it. He had no knowledge of Dr. Newton's books, but despite this, he encountered much that had been experienced by others, lending a powerful authenticity to the process. Time and again during regression, Jody expressed extreme dissatisfaction with his body. His less-than-perfect physicality was at the core of everything that was wrong with his life. He went back to being a child, where he remembered sitting in his high chair, unable to speak clearly, even though his autism was a mild form. He described the feeling of frustration because the words were formed in his mind but wouldn't come out. It felt to him as if he had been gagged. Then he went back even further to the time before his birth, when he was in the womb. Here it was even worse for him because he felt trapped, uncomfortable, and cramped. He was frustrated with his body, feeling that it wasn't the one he had chosen, and in his frustration he kicked so hard that he broke his mother's coccyx. He had no doubt that his body wasn't a good match for his soul and didn't like it at all. It didn't work the way he wanted it to, and everything about it felt stiff. He never felt properly integrated with it, and everything was a struggle for him. Overcoming this disdain that he felt for his body was going to be difficult for him, but until he did, he would be trapped forever in his unhappiness. We then visited another past life, where again he was unhappy with his body. After his death in that life, his most immediate past life, he found himself looking down at his body. Boy, the Matrix has treated him great so far. You know, low self-esteem, you know, is not happy with his body. You know, boy, uh, uh... <sighs> Come on. Boy, they're, they're treating him well. ...be with his body. After his death in that life, his most immediate past life, he found himself looking down at his body and feeling indifferent to it, as if it, too, didn't feel like it had been the right one. By now, though, he was dead and free of the heaviness and tiredness of that life. He felt fine. Here again there was a strong evidence of karmic planning because of the great disappointment felt with his body in both lives. Leaving that previous body, he was pulled forward by highly condensed magnetic energy. He saw a light ahead, which became stronger as he neared it. Which is exactly, you know, what NDEs say. So again, we have further cross-confirmation between multiple experiencer types where they're describing the same exact routine that ends up, what, in the light, the life review, and rinse and repeat, reincarnate, you know, or pre-birth memories, soul classes, soul school, whatever you want to call it, teachers, guides, a council, pre-birth planning, pre-birth memory, or uh, a reincarnation, and then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. It's the same old thing over and over and over again. It crosses all types of experiencer types, and it, in my opinion, it cannot be denied. It's all there front and center for everyone to see if... You choose to research it, and the I just you know hope that anyone listening today who is new or otherwise on the fence takes this topic seriously because the information's there, it's there. We you know we may not have like the full picture of everything, and that's because this system doesn't allow it. But we have at least a, a semi decent outline to the deception, and it's blatant. It's not like just like a few things here and there. It's blatant. 
closer, allowing his initial fear of the unknown to succumb to a loving energy, lifting his mood to one of bliss. He was now elevated to a place where he would have the opportunity to overcome the negative emotions brought about by his malfunctioning body, though even here it would be hard. His guide, Galcian, a warm and confident character, appeared Galcian. to him as an androgynous being of pure love. He gave him high marks for his performance in his last life and oh. told him that his rate of development in the current one with You're physical challenges had been tremendous. Oh, We're your progress has been tremendous. It's tremendous. Roll out the welcome wagon. Let's just fill that ego with everything that it needs and desires so that we can get you back here to reincarnate again. Come on. It's the same playbook over and over and over again and we keep falling for it over and over and over again when are we going to stop it it's up to us as individuals to stop it not anyone else and you know thinking that we're going to take on this place and shut it down it's just not going to work everything is based on on the individual it's a it's about forging your own path and getting yourself out of the situation if this, this whole thing would not continue to exist if it was capable of being shut down by one single individual or even a small group of individuals who knew what the hell was going on. Uh, you know, the soul trap is not new. We're just, you know, I'm presenting it in a, in a modern uh, context where we have access to more information, but the soul trap's not new. You know, it, it, the world is an illusion, and you know, and and let go of attachments and all that stuff. That's that's not new. It's been around forever. So, if that's the case, if it's been around that long, just with the the loose record of what we have available to us, let alone how many times this place has been, you know, reset over and over and over again, just with the information that we have, it's clear that many knew the, the deception that was going on here, or at least knew it to be an illusion and, you know, were very close, but likely failed. So, you know, it's just, the answer is not to go and, you know, think you're going to fight this. You, you, what right do you have as an individual to fight this place? What right do you have to fight other individuals who are believing in this illusion? You, you know, to, to think that we can go in and ride on our high horse and, and override everything, it's just, just not sensible. But I understand the fire, uh, and like, you know, and the drive to want to do something. I totally get it, not knocking it, but at the same time, don't risk yourself <laughs> when you're right there, you know, right there at the, you know, split pathways of being reincarnated or continuing to at least fall for their, for their bag of tricks and then liberation. I mean, really to, to be right there and then just like give it away because you want to play Batman or Superman or something. It just, and again, I'm not knocking it. I'm just trying to put it in context because I was there. I was there, so I am, I'm really not trying to knock anybody who may feel that way because I get it. I totally get it. And I think many of us have probably been there before where it's like, oh, now that we have this information, you know, we can go on and, and really take, you know, take on the whole thing. And that's just, it doesn't make sense because what is the Matrix likely going to do? It's going to provide you the illusion that you are taking on this place, that you are shutting it down. And even, even if it doesn't, the amount of complexity that must be involved with, with trying to do something like that, it's just too risky. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, when, you, when you're right there at the finish line, you're right there. You're this close. Current one with physical challenges had been tremendous, which is why it had been such a struggle. Jody, whose sole name was Yos, had often known his guide to be with him and reckoned that he'd saved him from death numerous times. When he visited his soul group, he described them as jollity and laughter, 
all of them operating on a harmonious wavelength. Oh, I bet they were. Next, he met harmonious with his bearded seniors, bind. often called the Council of Elders by LBL clients, Council of in bullshit. a small chapel that seemed more like a schoolroom with chairs and desks, with his guide sitting behind him. Oh, they get- just imagine you leave here and you got to go to school. Are you kidding me? Just imagine. How horrible was it when you were a child or a young adult? And then, oh, what? Oh, you, you did a great job. You, you know, you did better than we thought you were this lifetime. Good, great job. All right. School bells ringing. Ding, 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 ding. Off to class. All right. The council's there. The guy's there. The solo group's there. Ding, 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 ding. All right, everybody. Put your hands together. Sit down. M- make sure you got your shirt tucked in. And pay attention to the teacher at the blackboard. Come on now. Uh, uh, stop talking to others. Pay attention. We've got to get you back down there as soon as possible. Pay attention. See, this is the type of bullshit we're talking about. Really? A classroom setting? Get the hell out of here. Enough is enough. And this is, this is happening. Uh, you know, this was discussed in the first two books. That I did a cover to cover commentary. It's not like it's again. This is another piece of information that's there. A lot of times we don't get access to the to exactly what's happening there, but the school type setting, or even like the labor setting, where you're uh, seeing other beings in a labor like setting, like you know, um, mowing grass or, or or picking crops or something like that. It, it's it's almost like it's. It's uh, just more slavery within the freaking system. Why is that stuff popping up? First off, it's the continuity of familiarity between both worlds, the, the earth realm and the astral. But for fuck's sake, it's to, it's to just further indoctrinate you and make you believe and stay lost in this system and not think that you have any control whatsoever in it. A a classroom setting, if that's not a a representation of authority or perceived authority, I don't know what is. So deny it. you, You shouldn't even get to that point where you are in that situation. ...by LBL clients. In a small chapel that seemed more like a schoolroom with chairs and desks, with his oh, guide sitting behind him. Terrible. They gave him advice about his accuser of the School so-called sucked. rape, saying that she was providing him with yet another opportunity for advancement. Editor's Note One of the most powerful therapeutic tools in LBL therapy is the ability of the facilitator to suspend time and engage in the now time of the spirit world in order to better recognize client problems. The open mind of the soul in a superconscious state has more conceptual differentiation, with less rigid human boundaries than when we are in a conscious state. We are also not locked into linear time during an LBL session. Although we may take a client into the council chamber after a past life, a skillful facilitator is quite capable of reviewing current life trauma in front of the elders, to gain answers to client questions, oh, I bet as they our love other that. cases have demonstrated. Much positive therapy is achieved with both guides and elders participating in current human reality. Oh, yeah. So After they're, leaving they're just, they're all over the place. How they, look at how much good that they're doing down here. Oh, my God. The job that the council and God and Jesus and baby Jesus and all those clowns up there. All the archetypes, they are doing one heck of a job to make sure that humanity is running uh, prosperously and like everything is just running so beautifully. There's no problems down here at all. Wow. They are, boy, they deserve all the recognition in the world or in the multiverse. Wow. I mean, they j- they're knocking it out of the park down here. Jeez. Christ. I mean, I just can't get over how much good they're doing. ...be is achieved with both guides and elders participating in current human reality. 
After leaving his meeting with the council, Yos made a decision to meet the soul who had been his grandfather. Jody had hated him when he was alive because of his arrogance and cruelty, and he called him a bastard for upsetting and embarrassing <laughs> his mother about Jody's disabilities. Yet again, he was drawn back to this theme of his disappointment with his body. He took a few moments of quiet contemplation, after which he announced that he could now allow himself to feel differently about this man who had caused him so much hurt. They became friends, and Jody told him that he loved him and was sorry he had hated him, because he had now gained a sense of the man's love and humility. Jody's main goal in his LBL was to discover a route to happiness, so I suggested he ask his guide for help with this. Oh, okay. Galcian told him he had been putting too much energy into personal relationships, and this was wrong for him. That's because right. That you better, you got to listen to Galcian more. Jeez, what is going on with you? You really need to do that. Too much energy into personal relationships, and this was wrong Way for him. Way too much. Because that was not his plan. His purpose was to travel and to help others. Oh, then there was another moment of inner transformation when Jody announced that if he saw things globally, the fact that he came in with body infirmities didn't matter. However, he still felt dissatisfied that he would never achieve his human goals. Along with letting go of some of his dissatisfaction with his body, there were still hurdles for him to overcome. At the next point in our work together, Jody saw himself in a mirror. I see myself in a mirror. I am going into the mirror. There's a bright light there, as if I've gone beyond me, and I'm the light. It's beautiful, comforting. My heart is crying. It's as if I'm not allowed the fruits of it, the warmth and love. I'm there to observe. It feels like I have to be dead to be there. My heart is crying. It's as if I'm not allowed the fruits of it, the warmth and love. It's if I'm not allowed the fruits of it, the warmth and love. Well, isn't that beautiful? So loving. So loving. It feels like I have to be dead to be there. Ah. I have to go through this to the trial for rape, and then I can move on. There's a contentment to know that there's something more within me to connect to. Even Well, they should have cut off his nut chakras. I mean, uh, that's what should have happened when he was here. Editor's note. The mirror is probably symbolic oh, of Jody's now. mentally passing into the spirit world. In the place of life selection, he realized that he had chosen his parents more than his body. He was able to try out the body, but only when it was static. Editor's note. In the space of life selection... Uh, so edi editor's note, what they're talking about right there was pre-birth, too. Pre-birth uh, selection. He was able Editor's to... Editor's note. In the space of life selection, souls may take a participating role involving live action or that of an observer simply watching scenes unfold in the life to come. Occasionally, we hear, as in this client's case, of an observer who sees future bodies they might occupy only as static, inert, or suspended human forms. Then he felt confident about it, and it felt all right. But when it was too late, when he had incarnated into his body, when he started to move, he felt... Okay, I'm sorry to pause this again, but I think it's really important. I, I just want to back up to what Newton said and link it into something. We hear, as in this client's case, of an observer who sees future bodies they might occupy only as static, inert, or suspended human forms. Okay, so you know suspended human forms, and if you and if you look at um, if you look at soul, I think we even talked about it in this series. I'm pretty sure. Um, I think they call it the Hall of You in the Disney Pixar f movie. Uh, it's represented like where you know Joe is going and and looking at his pre birth selections or things like that and and that's it almost exactly how it is it's like static it's there you know there's there's just like a, a partial kind of image or representation about what could be what will be in relation to the life script that the matrix is kind of pushing and aiding you towards selecting so uh interesting to kind of see that crossover there i mean of course it's a very um 
it's not like I mean Newton doesn't really expand on it too much, but we we get what he's saying, and it, there's a clear kind of connection there between the movie and what and what's Newton's talking about and about it, and it felt all right. But when it was too late, when he had incarnated into his body, when he started to move, he felt pain. He still had difficulty in accepting that he had agreed to take it on. It was almost as if I was tricked into accepting it. Ah. After taking time to reflect in is. an almost miraculous... It was almost as if I was tricked into accepting it. Well, that's the problem, right? It's if you have already made it to this point. I try to really, really drive this point home. Like, where we are right now in this scenario is is optimal for liberation. Once you have made it, like, once you're involving yourself with the light and buying into the BS and allowing that sensory overload of love and light and... and um, ego boosting and 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 all this stuff to take over by the time you've rolled around on the assembly line gone through like let's just say the soul group the soul classes you know the council and the teachers or the guides whatever by the time you're at life selection you're cooked you're done like you, you're you're just consider it over right you're coming back to earth and that's all there is to it so you know i'm not trying to scare anyone i'm just trying to say it's important to keep these things in mind and that providing yourself the best pathway at the time of death while here and transferring over. That's why um, shielding yourself, making sure that nothing can interfere with you, non-interference, Sovereignty, liberation, creating your own realm, using your intention every step of the way to make sure that nothing, nada, can interfere with you or, or mess with you. That's why it's key. That's why it's key. You don't ever want to get to the point where you're picking out lives again and, quote, being tricked. Because you're past the point of no return. You've already, you know, shown an interest, like, Oh, well, that, you know, that, that light, mm, you know, that's, 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 that seems interesting. What's that? Why is it starting to feel good? And then it builds up and builds up and builds up. You have to have the, the will and the determination to say no, if that even happens. Personally, I feel that most of us who have an unrelenting intention for liberation we're gonna be fine like i'm not worried about it i'm just not i don't i don't allow myself to say oh well what if this or what if that i feel that if you have and i look i'm not knocking anyone who who has this mindset because i completely get it you know like well what if this and what if that there is no what if there is no what if. You are a creator being, a powerful creator being, strong. You have your own will, your own lucidity. You're capable of making your own decisions and applying that intention and making sure that nothing, or no, not even making sure, demanding unrelentingly that you are the one controlling the show, not the matrix, not the tunnel, not the light. None of us should be even tangling with the tunnel. But that all comes down to each of us as an individual. How much strength do you have within you to, to, to know deep down inside who and what you are and what you're capable of and that you are much, much more than this? Your existence goes way beyond this whole system, not just Earth. I'm talking about, you know, the astral realm, I'm way outside the, the, the overall mage system I'm talking, we go way beyond all of this. And we've somehow condensed our beliefs or assumptions about existence to this part of, let's just say, the multiverse, right? I mean, I don't know how else to frame it. That's like everything. That's the best word to use because everyone will kind of grab, you know, everyone kind of has an understanding of that. But the point is, is have complete unrelenting 
self-determination uh, within you that nothing is going to fuck with you. That's the bottom line. And if you're doubting yourself, then you have to get to a point. I don't, I don't necessarily say you have to, but I really think it's important to get to a point where you are comfortable with laying down the law and knowing with every fiber of your being that nothing is going to fuck with you. That's it. That's it. I think when you leave the door open, well, what if this, what if that, well, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? If there's a bunch of what ifs and we're all strong and, and, and unrelenting, well, guess what? We're fucked, right? So why have that mindset? Why allow yourself to even think like that? You, it, as long as it's deep within you, again, every five of your being, and that's why like researching this topic is so important because eventually I think as anyone starts to seriously look at this topic, not just picked it up a month ago or a week ago or even a year ago sometimes, right? Like it may take a couple of years to, to truly see just how powerful our intention is and that we are in control of the show but everything is trying to come at us in every which way to try and steal that individuality away but you need to get to the point where you see just how much of the how much power you do yield it's it's innately within you it's 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 embedded in your essence and only you can get to a point where you see that, where you know that unrelentingly. So what does that transfer over to? That transfers over to you living your day-to-day -day life unrelentingly. Where, hey, you know, th this, this bullshit tunnel or this bullshit light isn't going to do anything. Period, point blank. You'll get to that point. If you allow yourself to just look at the topic and consume the topic, you know, do research on your own. You, you don't have to watch my channel. You can go look at uh, Dan at Overwatch channel, Overwatch project. You can go look at um, uh, Wayne and Julie at Sovereign Spirits. I mean, it, look, there are options if you don't like my my way of kind of presenting things. But in the long run, like it's important to get to that unrelenting phase. I promise you, I promise you, if you just give it time, don't keep falling for all the distractions that are out there that are trying to suck you back in. And then look like what happens like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years from now, you know, you're on your deathbed and you're like, Oh, well, I better look into the soul trap. You know, like, no, it's, <laughs> you know, take the time now. You know, get, allow yourself a few years to, to get to that unrelenting phase. And then you could walk away. And, and as long as you're at that deep inner unrelenting phase where you are in control, screw the rest of it for the rest of your life. You don't have to. Anyways, I'm blabbing a lot. But, you know, it's just uh, I'm just trying to convey how empowering this information can be if you allow it to. I promise you. And you don't have to watch any of my videos. You just have to kind of look at the outlines of things that I've talked about and then go research experience or cases for yourself or have, you know, do your meditation sessions. Try to uh, pick up a lucid dreamer and astral projection practice or whatever the case may be, so that you are going out there and testing the waters for yourself and proving it to yourself. See, everything kind of comes full circle at some point if you are open to it, if you allow it to be part of your world. Now, I know we all live busy lives and, you know, some of us have to work harder than others, especially in this economy and stuff like that. But there's always going to be a certain amount of time that you can set aside for this. Whether it's this channel, 
Dan, Wayne's channel, or your own research. It does not matter. There will always be time that you can find in your week to get to the point at, you know, a few years down the road of being at the unrelenting phase. So I'll shut up now. I'm just trying to say that, you know, you hold so much more power than you can possibly imagine. And they cannot do a damn thing thing there is a reason why everything is smoke and mirrors there's a reason for it why everything is layered with deceptions because that's the only way they can pull the shit off is by deceiving and the system knows it the system admits it it's all there you just have to allow yourself to get there that's all all right, I'm done. We'll move on. Sorry. Rant is over. Taking time to reflect, in an almost miraculous change of mind, he decided that, after all, he was quite happy with his body, realizing that whatever his incarnated form, he can still learn valuable lessons. Editor's note. Body matches between the immortal character of a soul combined with the temperament of a temporary human brain to produce one personality for one lifetime is highly complex. We have only scratched the surface of this procedure. Understanding the process of how our spiritual planners select certain bodies for particular lives in the future during the karmic development of the soul seems to be beyond the comprehension of a still incarnating soul. During regression, Jody became aware of a negative emotion in his body. The effect of this negative emotion was a feeling of heaviness, and this heaviness, he believed, was self-punishment for his guilt at being a difficult teenager and for not helping his parents as much as he could. His parents then joined Jody, and his father had his arms stretched out to him. They hugged each other, and Jody said he was sorry to his mother, who told him it was okay. Despite their forgiveness, Jody still felt guilty, saying that as a teenager he was rebelling against the world and was confused. This led him to feel morose and dejected, the experience taking him toward more pain rather than away from it. Then, again, after another few moments' reflection, he experienced yet another miraculous change of heart. Sounding so happy, he announced, They chose me. I feel so much better. I almost want to cry. Thank you, Mom and Dad. Thank you for having me, for being my parents. It feels wonderful saying that. Now I knew there was a deep healing taking place. He had accepted that being him was okay, despite its limitations. He now had a better understanding of himself. I feel more complete, and there's an inner feeling of knowing that everything is going to be okay. A couple of days later, Jody told me that the LBL had healed his heart. Unfortunately, despite much emotional and financial cost... Jody was unable to prove his innocence in court, resulting in his imprisonment in one of Her Majesty's prisons. This was a dreadfully difficult time for him, firstly being unable to prove his innocence, and most particularly being surrounded by men of a violent and disturbed nature. Despite the terror of this confinement, he has told me that he has been able to come to terms with what happened and accept it in a way that he would never have been able to had it not been for his regressions and the strength he gained during his Life Between Lives experiences. He was also sure that if it hadn't been for this work, he would have had great difficulty in resisting the desire to end his life. He has now left jail and is in the process of rebuilding his life. I recently heard from Jody when he wrote these heartwarming words to me. I now feel more complete in myself. My pilot light is lit, a warm, glowing light which will never leave me now, warming my heart Excuse and mind. Excuse me, shit. My journey hasn't finished yet. All that has happened to me will become clear in my next episode, which I'm not shunning away Pardon from. Me. As you can imagine, facilitating Jody's Life Between Lives experience has been my privilege and pleasure. Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Michael brings up a good point, because Wayne, Wayne, um, Wayne's view is I think he he says he's, uh, if I remember correctly, he's like at 60 or 65%, something something along those lines, as um, 
as the thing, as the whole thing being a soul trap. But, uh, you know, I think that's a very, very, um, uh, low estimation, but I think it's because Wayne is a very analytical guy and I respect him greatly. So I'm not at all talking down about his opinion. And I just think, I think it's, you know, he's just being conservative and I get it. I get it. But, um, I think he's just, um, he, again, he's just being conservative with his stuff. I mean, if you, anyone who looks at his freaking website, how they can come back later and, and, and not see through the bullshit of this entire experience is beyond me. And I, I guess you can say, oh, uh, you know, I think, I think really a, a way to, let me just pop this up. Um, I think a way to kind of look at, Wayne's information, something him and I talked about, I think, in, in at least one or maybe a few of the streams that we did, is he, he you know, we were kind of debating, or at least throwing it out there, be, the difference between if this place is like a game or a, or a combination of a game that we kind of got sucked into because of curiosity and wanting to experience... Or if it's just like some flat out parasitic pressure cooker, right? I mean, that doesn't mean it can't be both. It doesn't mean that it can lure you under the guise of it being a game and this and that. But I mean, in the end, uh, I think the world, the realm speaks for itself. I mean, it's, it's a dog eat dog world. Everything eats <laughs> they have the food chain, you know, I mean, it's just, you have such poorly designed states of, um, consciousness, consciousness, especially with the human experience. But yeah, I mean, uh, I respect Wayne's opinion on, on like the percentage of how he looks at the soul trap. I just feel that it's a lot more conclusive than that. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure Dan does too, based on the conversations I've had, but the information that Wayne has is just priceless. I mean, and again, his website's trickedbythelight.com. Anyone who hasn't checked it out has to. I mean, it's a, it's just a, a huge, huge, vast array of information that uh, any how anyone can go to that site and then even add on to that information by doing their own research and not come away looking at this place with... Uh, with something being seriously wrong is beyond me. I, I, I it's just, it's there. And then as far as, you know, uh, p being a powerful creative being, we are, I mean, that's just the fact. Anyone who can go outside of their body and be lucidly aware of who and what they are and what they're capable of will immediately realize what they can do. That they can, you know, you can be in a situation that is freaky, scary, demonic, whatever you want to call it, and shut the entire thing down instantly. Instantly. You can create. You can build within the illusion of the matrix. So what is all that? Are we just some jack off? Like, are we just nothing? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's completely provable. I mean, it's, you know, I respect everyone's opinions and this and that, but, you know, as far as being a powerful creator being, that's not cherry picking at all. It's, it's, it's just a fact. And we can all go out there and prove it in different methods of con uh, consciousness, different, I mean, just even meditation that eventually leads to going outside the body or, or in a void like state. I mean, you can, you can prove these things by exiting the body and you know that you are more than your physical body and capable of doing many things. So anyways, that's just, I don't want to harp on that too much, but you know, we are, we're just, we're way, way more capable than this realm likes to chalk us up to be. 
Like one of the things I've talked about a lot is how growing up, I remember being in science class and my teachers like year in and year out, you're equivalent to, you know, a grain of sand on the beach, basically saying you're nothing. You're a piece of shit. That's basically what my science teachers would say. And I'm saying, I'm telling you, year in and year out, this would be things that I would hear. Right? And of course, it's from the scientific perspective, the materialist perspective, where, you know, you're just a physical body. You know, when you die, you're a bag of bones and that's it. And, you know, you're, you're done. That's it. You, you, there's nothing more to you but than that. And this realm just seems to get off on being able to make us feel lower and less than we truly are. And if you can continue to perpetuate that type of narrative, then you're just going to have a bunch of individuals lost here. And I mean, this, it, it, it just continues to prove itself. Like it makes us feel less than what we are. Anyways... That's my kind of response to that. So, uh, all right. So what we'll do is take about five minutes, five, six minutes, maybe seven minutes. And, um, I will be back with you shortly, my friends. So hang in there with me, take a stretch break, refill your water or whatever you got going on over there. And I'll be with you shortly. Thank you. All right, so Michael, basically what I'm seeing here is you say, yes, we are, quote, I am, but there is a source I am as well. Separating from that is foolish. So, so basically you're just saying stick with the collective, stick with the hive mind. I don't agree with that. I mean, I, I, I respect however you want to go down your path, my friend, but it's... Again, like it just feels like you're kind of caving to exactly what the system would want. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I, again, I respect that I'm not trying to pick on you or anyone. Like, I'm just trying to get what you're thinking and, and have a conversation about it. But as far as like, um, yeah, the uh, separating from the I am or separating from I'm sorry how did you word it separating from that is foolish how 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 are we talking about separating we're we're talking about connecting with our complete 100% true essence nothing more nothing less and deciding not to just fall into the hive mind and roll the dice that's the difference so, anyways, uh, I respect everyone's path, and and so, anyways, I'll I'll, I'll be right back, my friends.
another minute, my friend. Be right back.
and welcome back everybody okay so I'm going to be moving on to the next case oh before uh, we continue just as a reminder oh I got my phone on here just as a reminder I do have a new channel a couple new channels I have the truth and gaming site or truth and gaming channel available on YouTube where it's streaming right now and it's also available on rumble and then also the laughing at the clown world matrix and that's exclusive to odyssey and rumble so you can find links to those in the description tab if you're interested i also have a face facebook instagram twitter i have a youtube backup channel It'd be great if you could subscribe to that and hit the bell for all notifications if you're following if you want to get notified of when the channel goes live and i also have memberships available on odyssey and youtube where you can get extra content each month. We do a monthly members live stream. Also gives you access to the members research and chat server, Discord server. So feel free to check that out if you'd like. Your support's always appreciated but never expected. And I also have alternative ways if you'd like to uh, send a one-time donation to the channel or reoccurring through... Um, stream elements or stripe and so thank you very much for those who are members and have supported the channel i appreciate each and every one of you so uh without further ado let's move along oh boy hold on <laughs> do i have this set up correctly i may not <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to just bear with me one moment. I, I don't want to replay where we already let off. For some reason, I thought I had it queued up, but it looks like I might not have. Yeah, just, just bear with me one moment. I'm pretty sure I know where we left off, but... Okay, I'll be right, be right back. Just give me about 30 seconds here. All right, I found it. It's a professional operation around here. <laughs> All right, here we go. This will be the last case of the night. I am home. 28. I am home. By Scott DeTamble. Claremont, California. PL and LBL hypnotherapist, training assistant, and case reviewer for the Newton Institute. Cast out into the cold, naked and alone. Some souls feel this sense of banishment upon entering the earthly plane from the communal hearth of the spirit realm. Yet their exile is self-imposed. As souls come to realize they must venture forth into the physical to find the meat that brings sustenance and growth. There are many challenges in the world. In Monique's case, fierce human emotions were the wild animals that nearly chased her back into the warm embrace of spirit, 
before her ordeal was accomplished. On an overcast April morning, Monique sent me an email. I have a history of clinical depression, with two failed suicide attempts by drug overdose. I have received psychiatric treatment, which included the use of Prozac. I have attended psychological counseling. I've also participated in self-help groups and read many self-help books. These experiences have given me survival skills, but not one of them has taught me how to enjoy living. My depressive thoughts and feelings are best summarized as being homesick. I long for my ethereal cosmic home. You might imagine how delighted I was to read about home in Michael Newton's books. It's time for me to have my own life between lives revelation. I want to avoid another clinical depressive episode that is looming over my head. Monique was sinking into darkness, desperately reaching out for the golden ray of a transcendent experience. I felt serious concern about the gravity of her situation, yet instinctively felt we would be guided. We spoke by telephone, and Monique told me that, yes, she was homesick for spirit, but both of her suicide attempts had actually been precipitated by turbulent and broken relationships with men. As we set a date for our meeting, there emerged from her voice a hopeful note. Soon she sent me another email. I have begun my homework assignment for the session. My short list of questions is not so short. Ultimately, I've decided to bring all of my questions and to keep an open mind. Our session progressed smoothly. While Monique's soul may have felt some reluctance to incarnate, she could not conceal a youthful curiosity and excitement at the prospect of a new body and new adventure. Scott, what are you sensing or feeling there in the womb? Monique, well-being, very safe. Scott, when did you first join the fetus? Monique, moments after conception. I needed to verify that it was indeed happening. I can see cells splitting. I'm satisfied. Scott, wow. As your body develops, as time goes by, do you move in and out or do you stay put? Monique, I don't return until the beginning of the second trimester. Editor's Note Souls permanently join the fetus of their human hosts between the fourth and ninth month. While the soul might visit the mother during the first three months, apparently during this early period there is too little brain tissue for a successful merger with the developing fetus. Scott, what do you find at that time? Monique, I can feel the roundness of my fingers, attachment to mother, the umbilical cord. I begin to suck my thumb. It comforts me. Reassuring. Scott, does your soul mind feel this body is a good match for you or not? Monique, yes, a good match. It will have fluid motion, like the freeness of my soul. Scott, is that why you chose this body, or are there other reasons? Monique, I need a female body to have children and to be married to Thomas. Also, being female, I will feel vulnerable. Monique connected with her soul consciousness in the womb portion of the session, telling of soul agreements as wife and mother, and a need to be uh, vulnerable in her present incarnation. Yes, yeah, soul agreements. You need to be vulnerable. You need to be vulnerable and 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 just completely adherent to whatever the matrix script is is pressing upon you. And don't forget about that karma agreements as wife and mother, and a need to be vulnerable in her present incarnation. Be vulnerable, be very the past vulnerable. past life experience that formed the next part of her session introduced another range of emotional lessons. Monique's mind drifted back, not to her most immediate past life, but to a much earlier lifetime, where she was a young woman within a band of nomadic hunters who stalked game high in the Alps. Oh. Editor's Note our LBL facilitators often ask clients something on the order of go back in time to the past life that most significantly relates to your current problem. It is remarkable how quickly a subject in deep hypnosis can sort through their spiritual memory banks and lock on to the appropriate life to discuss. A client might even override a command by the facilitator to go to their immediate past life 
in order to reach the life they most need to review in terms of their karmic issues today. Apparently, this is what happened with Monique. Scott, are you sitting, standing, or lying down in this past life we're exploring? Monique, I'm kneeling. Scott, are you alone or with someone? Monique, I'm with Joe Moore, who's dying. Scott, oh, what's Joe. happening? Monique, I don't know what happened. He was injured. A puncture wound. A knife? I don't know what to do for him. Scott, and you're kneeling? Where is he? Monique, he's on the ground, lying down on his side. Scott, where is the wound, do you know? Monique, I can't see it first, there's so much blood. I think it's on his side. Scott, are you in a city or out in the countryside? Monique, we're high in the mountains. It's cold, but it's not snowing right now. There's a clearing of dirt. The trees have snow on them. The rocks have snow on them. Scott, can you see Joe Moore's face? Monique, I roll him onto his back and I can. He's in anguish. He hurts. Now I can see the wound is in his right side, in the ribs. He's dying and he knows. He's not able to speak, too much blood in his mouth. I can see he's dying. I've come too late. Scott, what was your relationship with Joe? I've come too late, so... Monique. You've no. come too late, so, you know, what, what would this be in human terms? Oh, let me blame myself. If I was just here a little bit earlier, or if I just saw the signs, I could have saved them. You know, fear, guilt, shame, rearing his ugly head. It's your relationship with Joe Moore. Monique. Not his sister, but love him like a sister. He made us laugh at life. Scott, all right now, let that fade, and let's move to the last day of your own life in this mountain life. Be there. Last day. Describe what's happening. Monique. I'm in a blizzard. I'm lost. My people can't find me. I can't find them. The coldness. I've gone beyond the coldness. It was very painful. But now it's numb. I'm very tired. And I'm just going to go to sleep. I know I'm not going to wake up. There's no struggle left. Scott, how old are you on this last day of your life? Monique. Twenty-one. A young woman. Scott, what do you think about this life you've just lived? Monique. It was curious to be dependent on land and animals. I'd not experienced that. To live like one of the animals. To understand them. Scott. It's time to move to the moment just after death, and you can rise from your body, and you'll be able to continue to talk to me. Feel yourself expanding to the highest levels. Where are you in relation to your body? Monique. I'm very close to my guide. I can still see very my body. Very close. I regret that it's time to be leaving it. It's six weeks before they will find my body and bring it back to the village. A long time... But my body was preserved because of the snow. There was some nibbling on my leg from the animals. Scott, is there a ritual for burial? That's the dog-eat-dog -dog world right there. Um, there. There's a lot of interesting stuff um, with those. Uh, some of you may have looked into the cases like this, especially like when mediums are involved with police, where verifiable cases, not talking about... Some jerk off on Lifetime Network saying, oh, well, you know, I, I believe that, you know, they're in a cornfield, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And then nothing ever becomes of it. No, we're talking about verifiable cases where someone like a, like a parent, for instance, loses a child. Right. And they hire the services of an intuitive medium who actually can help them. Right. It was done work with the police in the past or something like that they've they've actually got the ear of a, of a specific maybe detective uh inside the force 
and they'll say, I mean, I, I've seen some wacky, wacky stuff where, for instance, there's this case that stands out. It was a mother and father who lost, I think it was like a, excuse me, a, um, I want to say like maybe like an 18-year-old or 19-year-old son. And the parents knew they were kind of mixed up with the wrong people. And, and just they knew something was wrong. And so they were able to trace some of their steps, obviously through ABC police work, the cell phone records, things like that. But then the cops reached a dead end. They had the dogs out and everything. And like, it's like they, they were able, the dogs were able to sniff the body up until a certain point. And then the trail ran cold. Okay. And the cops were like, we're sorry, we can't really do anything. Well, you know, the cops like, well, you could possibly reach out to this medium. We've worked with her before. We've had some success. Well, the medium, you know, it's like one of those mediums out there who is, you know, nobody knows who she is or, it, or if she does help, it's an unlimited capacity. She doesn't charge a ton of money. She just, she just got to put food on the table. Right. But they've had success with the police before. Anyways, um, the deceased son starts to come to the medium because the connection between that the police gave between the medium and uh, the and the police department with the mom, they they connected them, and so the son's energy was still lingering around, and the medium was even getting visions of how this whole thing would roll out, and it, and it lasted I think four to six weeks somewhere around that range, and. It kind of built up and built up and built up, and like she kept getting the visions, and like they, and it would kind of lead them closer and closer and closer to where his body actually was, like basically, and they they dropped him in an abandoned house. It was horrible, but needless to say, the the son came in a vision, in a communi telepathic communication. Basically, that the medium was driving in a car one night. And again, you have to imagine this is building up over weeks. It's not like, oh, it just, you know, the answers were there every single time. It was like a gradual buildup because there's like a differential between our worlds. And, you know, who knows how he or it was trying to re relay this information to the medium so that they can solve his murder once and for all. Well, anyways, the... The, the son appears in the back seat. Now, mind you, the mediums, you know, look, the, the son appears in a mirror, obviously. Like, you know, we all have mirrors in our car. So it's interesting that, you know, that is like the delivery device <laughs> for, for this type of communication. And the son saying, oh, the son like is like worried that they're not going to find his body. And he's trying to drop all these weird types of clues along the way. And then finally, he just starts to like not have a care in the world and says to the medium, oh, they're going to they're going to find my body at such and such address, at, you know, in, in about six to seven days. And that's exactly what happened. They found him. Uh, it was a similar situation. To what we're hearing with this, like where it was uh, really cold out and the body was frozen I don't know about the whole, you know, animals gnawing on the legs or anything like that or any of the limbs. But the point is, is these types of things happen. It's just that they're not talked about. And police departments don't want to talk about them either. Because what is, I mean, just based and especially with, with the Western way of thinking... These types of things are looked at as crazy or silly or stupid as that. But if you get that one detective or one cop on the force who is open or has had a proven, consistent association with a certain medium, I mean, Christ, a lot of good can come from it. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, 
the end result is actually good. But if you're a family member and you've lost your son or your daughter or husband or wife or something like that, and, and, and a medium is able to kind of step in and be able to help out through the matrix in some form, then it does help ease some of the trauma. It's not going to eliminate it, but it does help it. And so anyways, it's, uh, these things just aren't talked about. They're just not, it's, uh, but they're out there. They're out there. There are plenty of cops who have come forward, detectives specifically, who have come forward and talked about this stuff. Uh, and again, I'm not talking about Lifetime Network or or any of these BS things that are out there. The, the, some of them, of course, could be true. But the bulk of that stuff is just overly fantasized and, and, and made to look completely ridiculous and silly. And that's because of the society and the indoctrination in which we've all been under from cradle to grave. So uh, there, it just... It's amazing. It's it's amazing that this stuff happens, and and it's just discounted as if it's nothing, as if it's nothing. So, um, anyways, I just thought I'd get that in there. I just want to give a big thank you to Mick Dan for the very kind and generous super chat on Stream Elements. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. All right, we'll continue. Thanks again, my friend. They wrap me in leathers and they cremate me. My guide and I watch. Scott, does your guide communicate with you while you're watching this? Monique, no, it's just a silent reverence. We leave with my body burning. In this past life of long ago, after becoming lost in a storm, Monique went to sleep to escape the pain of living. Yet it was important during this session to remind her of the sad regret she felt at leaving a young, healthy body in the prime of life. Soon her spirit guide spoke, telling her when and why he acted in the past life to stimulate her to feel particular emotions. Scott, is there a time when your guide communicates with you? What passes between you? Monique, he assures me that Joe Moore is well and fine. He has arrived home. Scott, tell me about your guide. Monique, I call him Zion. He's tall with a stern expression, Zion. stern posture. He wears a black robe and hood. Scott, what does he tell you next? What does he say about your spiritual progress? Monique, he asks me what I think about my own progress, and I'm kind of indifferent to it. I don't really care if I made progress or not. That's why he is stern with me. I didn't perform as well as I could. But he should be happy that I agreed to be born at all. There huh, you go. He's even exactly. stern with that answer of mine. He thinks I should be more serious about all of this. See, this is the fear, guilt, shame matrix in full display. Full display. It's blatantly showing us exactly how it works. You didn't do good enough. Shame, shame, shame. You didn't provide enough loose for us. You, you know... You suck. It's like, when does it end? That's the problem. When are we going to wake up and say enough is enough? We're just going to keep falling for this bullshit? This, just hear what they say. Just hear this out one more time. And I'm kind of indifferent to it. I don't really care if I made progress or not. That's why he is stern with me. I didn't... He does it. So that's the rebel attitude. I don't care if I made progress or not. I don't give a shit. I'm just happy to be the hell out of there. Well, oh, your guide is going to, uh, you know, going to, Zion's going to be all up in your shit. Or not. That's why he is stern with me. I didn't perform as well as I could. Oh. But he should be happy that I agreed to be born at all. Exactly. Huh. He's exactly. even stern with that answer of mine. He thinks I should be more serious about all of this. Yes, take take the illusion and the deception more seriously. How dare you? How dare you take everything more seriously? Because the clown show down on Earth, it's all legitimate. It's not an illusion. It's all for your spiritual growth, and we love you. How does he feel about your performance in that lifetime? Monique, 
he said that I certainly did learn how the animals live, and I did very little to understand the feelings of my people in my village. The only true concern I showed was the death of Jomor. There were other deaths. My parents. I felt nothing when they died. He's asking me why my answer is so flippant. I because, because he's I they sick and home. tired of the bullshit. That's why. He wants why. me to feel more compassion. Scott, does he give you any advice about this? Monique, yes. He manipulated me to find Jomor. And he asks oh. me, How did you feel when you found Jomor? And I was sad when I found him. I was upset at seeing his blood. I was sad that his life was ended. He manipulated me, and I was sad when I found him. Wow, isn't that revealing? I mean, come on, it's right here. I would say, you know, black and white, whatever you want to call it. I mean, whatever, left and right audio <laughs> ear, left and right headphone. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it, we're hearing it point blank. It, the whole thing is a ruse. We've been set up. We keep falling for BS. I was sad when I found him. I was upset at seeing his blood. I was sad that his life was ended. That he would not be able to hunt. It was a moment of compassion. And this is what Zion wants from me. This feeling. Scott, does he tell you anything else about that? Monique, I actually go into a course of study on emotions. Feelings. A lot of time is spent watching people. Watching my peers. Scott, do you mean watching people on Earth? Monique, no. Watching my peers in spirit. Seeing when they laugh, or the frustration when someone is struggling to understand a new concept. I'm given a lot of time to watch so that I can identify their feelings on sight. Scott, so this course of study takes place in the spiritual realm? Monique. Yes. Editor's Note While the author has explained about soul capacity for studying human emotions from the spirit world, I should add that there is also a spiritual place for further study, in private or in groups. I have mentioned this teaching tool before in connection with other cases. This area has been called the Space of Transformation where a timeless energy field exists that allows soul energy to blend into the field and become amorphous, totally integrating into a particular human feeling or emotion to sharpen their sensitivity to beings on Earth. Souls can capture the essence and assimilate the energy from both living and non-living things within belts of concentrated energy. This space has other teaching capabilities for souls, such as working with substances on other physical and mental worlds. Scott, does your guide Zion help you on this course, or are there other instructors? Monique, there are other people, like helpers or tutors, and they say, look and see. See why he's frustrated? Do you see what he's reaching for? Do you see why he can't reach his goal? Do you see why you need to know this? Scott, why do you need to know this? Monique, Zion tells me you cannot be a healer if you cannot identify what hurts. In a pure state of energy, souls do not have a central nervous system, as in their human form, but they are capable of study, either by themselves or in a classroom situation, about the complex human reactions to stimulus that causes love, hate, fear, anger, and so forth. Insane. Souls acquire this sensitivity during their incarnations, and carry this experience to the spirit world between lives. Exactly, exactly. This is what we talk about all the time, how this stuff carries over. It crosses between both worlds. It's a continuity of familiarity. It's something that we start to get indoctrinated into believing is normal. It's not normal. It's complete insanity to think that things like this is what existence is it's ridiculous it's absurd we have to start taking ourselves into account 
our own sovereignty and saying enough is enough. How long do you think that you deserve to put up with this bullshit and continually reincarnate? And how long are you going to allow yourself to have a limited uh, perception about what is and what is possible? Again, like uh, like the big the big thing I try to drive home in, in many videos is that we have to just think bigger, my friends. That's all. We just have to think bigger. All of these experiencers, and I mean all of them. Maybe, 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 maybe there are some exceptions out there, but I'm going to tell you point blank, I don't think there are. I think all experiencer types, all experiencer cases are a representation of the matrix. And so you have to ask yourself if there's this whole big multiverse out there, if, if, if we're this infinite being, infinite creator capable of going in and exploring and experiencing different things, why does everything kind of almost always kind of boil down to like a, a this, to something that you're familiar with? Because it's a big fat deception. It's a big, fat deception, and we just need to take accountability and recognize that we are more than our physical bodies, that we are capable of liberating ourselves in dictating what we want to do, not what the Matrix thinks we should do. That's it. That's it. Just allow yourself to try. Because there's no harm that comes from that. There's no harm from standing your ground and doing what you need to do for you. And if we're all wrong, if we can all sit here and maybe we've just been, you know, sitting here and, and chat, you know, weekend after weekend for, for years on end, just talking about this stuff. And maybe we're all wrong. And if we are, so be it. But I will say this. There is... There is no way to know if you are right or you are wrong if you don't try to forge the sovereign path. There's no way. If you just want to chalk it up into, you know, like, oh, everything is as advertised or maybe I can kind of sneak in here or maybe I can sneak in here and it's familiar to you, that doesn't seem right to me. It seems like a setup. So all I'm saying is, is you know, if everything is love and light, if, you know, Jesus and God and all this stuff is correct, right? The light is literally God, the creator, if there's a freaking creator at all, right? That's a big assumption in and of itself. If that's true, then guess what? If it loves you, if everything's love and light, then it can wait. It would clearly understand if you just came from this fucking cesspit of insanity and did your own thing. It would clearly be able to forgive you and understand that you took such a path. But if you don't take that sovereign path, I don't know. Seems like you just you could just walk right into the trap all over again. I don't know. I don't have definitive answers. All I have is a rough outline of what I think is going on. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I never, ever have once said that. But I think when you stack everything together, the evidence seems pretty damn clear as to what's going on. And we just need to get to that unrelenting point where we feel comfortable with who and what we are. And that nothing is going to stop us. And if we are wrong, we will evaluate the situation when we get to that point and make a decision from there. But to rush into something, to rush down the tunnel, to rush to the light, to, to, to have this life review and get memory wiped and, and potentially being reincarnated again, hell to the no. Hell to the no. We're better than that. We deserve better than that. Just the fact that you, we all come here 
lifetime after lifetime with no memory that alone speaks volumes that in and of itself is the biggest red flag of all of this anyways let's move on i'm getting heated nations and carry this experience to the spirit world between lives i might describe this process as a form of sympathetic awareness toward the human state of capability about having feelings and what those emotions mean in terms of reaction to events. For Monique, a clear pattern emerges about her need to understand the importance of human emotions. In her tribal hunter lifetime in the Alps, Monique was somewhat indifferent, even callous, although her guide began to induce feelings in her. Then, in Spirit Between Lives, she focused on a course of study and emotion. And finally, in the present, she chose a body that is much more sensitive and vulnerable. She walks a tightrope in the present lifetime. She needs to feel, but the intense emotional struggles of her romantic relationships unbalance her and threaten to tip her over the edge. The heartbreak of her fractured marriage with Thomas and a recent tempestuous love affair with Jeremy were particularly difficult. She wrote of this latest the stormy scandal, relationship. Scandal. I know that love is eternal. With Jeremy, he smiles at me, and I know who he is, and I love him fiercely, ferociously. But somehow my relationship with him has been full of hurt feelings, anger, and frustration. That's some nice soul group We stuff turn right toward there. each other until hurt feelings and anger lead to abandonment again. In the soul group meeting, we learn <laughs> how Monique's <laughs> lessons are related to the souls of two of her great loves. We also find the ultimate reason for her studies in emotion. Scott, you mentioned your soul group. Would you like to check in with them? Monique. Yeah, let's file a it's complaint. It's a short distance. I can see it from here. Scott, describe the place for me. Monique. It's circular. It's hmm. like light energy, domed. It oh. provides a boundary. Editor's note. With some souls, especially the younger ones, there is a sense of spiritual enclosures or boundaries separating their own soul group from others in the afterlife. That's right. Separation. Got to make sure to keep everyone separated so that the narrative is, is continued. And then once the memory wipe is achieved, or at least part of the memory wipe is achieved, or like the... Uh, most recent lifetime that you came from is starting to fade or you're buying into the BS of karma and, and, and all this other stuff and that, you know, you need to uh, reunite with this group, then things will start to open up a little bit more. But guess what? At that point, you're done. You're cooked. You're, you're already fallen for the BS. You, you've already allowed yourself to show interest and, and move forward through your intention that everything is, well, everything is as advertised. And then guess what? Then the whole astral may open up to you or or the soul, you know, the soul classes or the, the guides, the council. Uh, well, however, it's all going to un unravel. I don't know. But it's pretty clear that they, they want to make sure to, to keep things compartmentalized, just like what they do here, like how we're... Uh, completely blocked off from information that can benefit the overall of humanity, like uh, the masses. For instance, things like free energy. For instance, things like mineral spring reserves, water that can help you, keep you healthy. Th um, yeah. There are so many things you could think of. Like not being inundated with chemicals and genetically modified organisms in your food. And there's a lot of other things I can say, but I'll lose my account. So anyways, it's uh it just is it's it's all about conditioning and compartmentalization. I mean, Christ, just look at what the whole thing uh with uh you know we landed on the moon, you know, that whole thing. If you can compartmentalize that, seriously, that's, that's, a, that's a hell of a, a, a thought experiment to analyze, right? If you can compartmentalize 
everything that happened with that operation and it not get out, even though the evidence is obvious when we look at it in the 2000s, right? At the time, it shows how few needed to be at the top and involved to get that type of thing believed across the realm, right? It doesn't take much. You can see how easily manipulated we are. And it's no different in the astral, especially when there are technologies or capabilities, at least, energy frequencies that are there and capable of zapping your memories because you think it's part of some sort of karmic debt or some sort of learning or spiritual evolution that you need to do in order to obtain Ascension. Because that's what they're selling. They're selling Ascension. I hate that word. I, I can't stand the connection to that whole thing. Like, because of the, the, the whole New Age things. It's cringy as hell. But that's what they are selling. They're selling the pyramid scheme. And they're just hoping that they can convince you this one more lifetime. And then one more lifetime. And just keep convincing you. And keep convincing you. Be there now. Is there anything meaningful going on right now between you and your group? Monique. Yes. Thomas and Jeremy. Yes. Who was Joe Moore. And I are in studies of the emotions. On our next visit to Earth, this visit, this incarnation, we'll do this. Scott. This is a plan you three have? Is there a goal to these studies? Monique. Compassion. They relate to compassion. Scott. So you three are going to come and learn about emotion, live it, study it, really immerse yourselves? Monique. Yes. We're going to take it out on each other. Act it out, sound it out, lay it out. Yeah, keep Scott, playing the game. Do you have a primary aspiration? Monique, yes, to care for those who come back from Earth. Scott, I can see why compassion might be important. The aches and pains of Monique's romantic entanglements in the present day are not random events. Her sufferings are not the result of bad karma, nor are they punishment from a spiteful creator. These circumstances were self-chosen and mapped out in concert with two dear soul group companions as part of a grand study of human emotion. All three have agreed to incarnate and interact in order to explore the intensity of All human agrees. feelings. In Monique's case, these experiences will serve to advance empathy and compassion in preparation for her future work as a caretaker of souls returning from Earth. Oh, a caretaker. Pieces of the puzzle come together. The larger picture begins to take shape. Deeper understandings... Of You've always been the caretaker, Mr. Torrance. I've always been the caretaker. Standings of her emotional lessons are gained as Monique's spirit guide now leads her to appear before her council of elders. Scott, tell me where you go now. Monique, it appears very much like a temple. I see us moving through archways. The elders are sitting straight across in a row, in throne-like chairs. There are seven of them. Scott, Good. What position do you take up in relation to these wise ones? Monique. In the center, I stand. I want to stand behind my guide, Zion. I don't want to be in front of them. Good old Zion's Zion. Zion's next to me, but I want to be behind him, like a child would hide behind your leg. Scott. Do you sense any sort of feeling or emanation from the council members to make you feel that way? Monique, yes, and it's really weird. They are indifferent. It's not really indifference. It's not acceptance. It's not dissatisfaction. I can't tell what they expect from me. Scott, do they offer any criticism or encouragement? Monique, they give me understanding of my defiance and my feeling of disappointment and hesitation in facing them. That's right. That in itself. The feeling is... of disappointment when I face them. 
The fear, guilt, shame. I did not live up to your expectations, so therefore I suck. And I must do better by what? Reincarnating. See how this all rolls? I mean, it's just so obvious. I mean, it's a clown show. Total freaking clown show. They've always been the caretaker. Do they offer any criticism or encouragement? Monique, they give me understanding of my defiance and my feeling of disappointment and hesitation. In Get that defiance me. out. That in itself out, out, is a out. message to me. Scott, how do you decipher that? What does it mean to you? Monique, it means that you can't scold someone into learning something. The elders do not scold. Instead, they gave me understanding, and I was able to comprehend the lesson and see the necessity for progress. Scott, what message is being given to you that can be useful in your current life as Monique? Monique, Today I've learned compassion, but I need to learn forgiveness. Scott, so the compassion is more from a past life, but forgiveness is the present life lesson? Monique, yes. Scott, what is true forgiveness? Monique, it is understanding that each creation has their own method of learning and producing, and they're entitled to mistakes, as I am. The growth process isn't perfect, and you must understand that so you don't always remember people for the hurt you imagine. Ah, them. yes, it's not perfect, but don't remember the hurt that's been cast on upon you or the hurt that you've cast on upon others so that you can learn from it and so others can learn from their hurt. It's insanity. Insanity. How can you learn in an experience or a realm that you come to that you're blocked off from that information that you're supposed to improve upon. It's insane. Anyways, I have one thing to say. Or actually, Mr. Torrance has one thing to say, and hopefully I don't get struck for this. You've always been the caretaker. <laughs> You've always been the caretaker. Not. The hurt you imagined from them so this is something you create for yourself, this hurt? Monique. Sometimes. Souls are not always on track with their purpose. But you have a choice. Scott. You have a choice to protect yourself from getting hurt? Monique. Well, you can, but then you don't benefit fully from your lesson. You don't have the scenario to have an imagined hurt to forgive. Scott. It seems like a kind of game. Monique, it is. These are parameters that we put up from which to learn. In LBL Trance, a wise friend once spoke to me of Earth as a testing ground. The spirit world's a resting place. You learn, you teach, you reevaluate. But then you have to test what you've learned. You test yourself through living different lives to see if it's really, truly become part of your essence. It's like, when you've been hurt, do you have it deep within you to forgive? Do you have it deep within you to show compassion? Do you have unconditional love without demands? All of these things oh. are tested in a life. That's like separating the wheat from the chaff. Oh, yeah. It, everything's so tested. What about the psyche and the life script of the mass murderer, the mass rape? Grapist, you know, I mean, all those types. Of we can go on forever about this, right? Come on, let's get real. If everything was about love and 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 you know acceptance and trying to learn and grow and all that stuff, well, why would the human body, the meat suit, be so programmed to be susceptible to such things? Don't you think that a creation that is so glorious and so perfect could do a little bit better of a job with the design of the meat suit? I mean, it's done a wretched job. It's a joke. Complete joke. 
I mean, again, let's get, let's just get real. Let's just talk Turkey and be honest with one another instead of just beating around the bush and, and pretending that everything is love and light. Cause it's certainly not. All of these things are tested in a life. That's like separating the wheat from the chaff. Monique's session was winding down. Scott, I would like you to ask the council some of your personal questions. What was the purpose to be gained from your past possessive relationships? Monique. More scenarios for forgiveness? Scott. What lesson are you to learn from your interaction with Jeremy in this incarnation? Monique. Hmm. What it feels like not to be forgiven. It's the shoe on the other foot. Jeremy is a very close soulmate. Not my primary soulmate, but very close. Scott. Are there any suggestions from the Council or Zion about what you can actually do now in your life to progress? Monique. I've been given ears to hear, to listen, to pay attention. Scott, are there any actions you can take? Monique, I will be guided in actions, as I have been guided here to you. As the session closed, Monique was granted a parting gift. Scott, take a last look around and see if there's anything we might have missed. Monique, I'm receiving an energy adjustment of feeling <laughs> less homesick. Why are you talk like that? They're aligning me so that I won't <laughs> be affected I'm sorry, by I'm so sorry, much. I'm sorry. I'm receiving an <laughs> energy adjustment of feeling less homesickness. They're aligning me so that I won't be affected by that so much. Scott, who is doing this? Monique, two healer workers. I'm receiving an energy adjustment. <laughs> Feeling less homesickness. They're aligning me so that I won't be affected by that so much. Monique. I'm receiving an energy <laughs> adjustment of feeling less homesickness. They're aligning me so that I won't be affected by that so much. Scott. Who is doing this? Monique. Two healer workers. They are not strangers to me, but I do not feel them as intimately as I do my soul cluster. This is given to me to encourage my progress toward the very kind of work that I aspire to do myself. Scott, what does that feel like? It's such a clown Monique, show. I feel it in the solar plexus. Right here. The homesickness is an extreme desire to just be at home. Like, I've had a hard day at work, I want to go home and get in bed kind of a feeling. Only I can't really go home and get in bed from Earth to the spiritual home. Scott, what does this have to do with your suicide attempts? Monique, it is the nature of this spirit to prefer home. Scott, so they do something to you? Making you feel how? Monique, I can see them actually moving the energy of my aura around. They're mixing pink into my white and light blue, <laughs> creating pale lavender. I can feel the lessening of the need to be home as they do that. I can see your aura. Editor's note. The receiving of an energy adjustment here is interesting because there is no actual infusion of new energy to upset the balance of volume initially brought into Monique's body. Rather, the existing vibrational frequency is altered in Monique's human aura form to advance the pink energy tones of passion with clarity of thought in white blended to the wisdom of the color blue. A new lavender aura from this mix is designed to assist Monique in her human emotion lesson learning. Auras for souls actually in the spirit world are far more consistent and slow to change over time than human auras. People confuse these two auras thinking they are the same when they are not. Scott, what a blessing. <laughs> Relax. Breathe. Take all the time you need. Yeah. Just tell me when you're ready to move on. Monique, I'm ready already. Three years after her session, Monique is still with us. Living, working, growing. She struggles at times, but no longer feels cold, naked, or alone. She is excited about her new role as a grandmother. She continues to listen and to practice forgiveness as best she can. Here... 
She writes about some of the insights that she gained from her Life Between Lives experience. I guess you could call the despair that gave me two suicide attempts and thoughts of yet another attempt homesickness, sick and needing to go home. But my LBL session has shown me that I am home. Earth is real, but it's only an extension of the heavenly classroom. Oh, yeah, it's so real. There's no pass or fail. It's simply having an experience. If it wasn't pass or fail, it's simply having an experience, then why do you need to keep coming back and working on things and being memory wiped in the process? It, it, he, the contradictions just in that very statement at the end, we've got eight seconds to go, is ridiculous. Just seriously, hear this one more time. It can, and take into consideration everything we've talked about in all these Michael Newton series, all the NDEs, all the after-death communications, and on and on and on. There's no pass or fail. No pass It's simply or fail. having an experience. Yeah. Living isn't overwhelming anymore. In fact, my thoughts of suicide have taken a change. I'm now thinking that it might be wiser to live to be 90 years old, <laughs> so I can get two lifetimes out of one. Anyways, <laughs> all right, <laughs> it's been fun, my friends. I'm going to be headed on over to the um, Truth and Gaming channel after. We're going to be firing up The Witcher 3 with part 20, so feel free to swing by. And again, just as a reminder for anyone who may have just kind of gotten here or came in there in the second half, um, there is a laughing at the Matrix Clown World channel that I opened up on Odyssey and Rumble. You can find those links in the description. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, YouTube backup channel, which is good to subscribe and hit the bell to. Well, subscribe and hit the bell to any of these platforms that you wish to follow the channel on. And just so you get notifications because sometimes notifications aren't received. So I uh, would love to... Uh, be able to get those out to you just in case things are a little wacky here so whoa. that was a little loud i apologize um so yeah anyways i'll be over playing some witcher in about 10 minutes i appreciate each and every one of you and we will likely wrap up this series with part 10 in the next stream so i want to thank anyone who donated tonight super chats or through stripe or stream elements i appreciate you and all the members out there thank you so much and anyone watching and uh please consider hitting the like button on your way out it does help the algorithm and get the word out about the channel and even commenting helps on all the platforms take care of yourselves don't work too hard and uh, we may see each other tomorrow sunday september 10th if not uh maybe tuesday uh, not not exactly sure, but we, we may sneak the last one in tomorrow, so. And the next monthly members live stream for anyone who is a stream levels member, that will be Sunday, September 24th. Thanks so much, my friends. See you again soon. And uh, maybe see you at the Truth and Gaming channel with Witcher. Got an interesting segment coming up on that one. Got a little loose. We got a little loose related adventure we're going into. Thanks so much. Take care, Sydney. Kiko, True Detective, Uni, Thomas, Triple, or Lindy, <laughs> Terry, Conscious Soul, KC. Mao, thanks so much, my friends. See you soon. <laughs>